a look at investment trust performance in 2023 and an outlook for 2024. Follow along with the chapters which easily mark which sectors I'm covering. This is 3i, the UK's largest investment trust with market cap of about 22 billion. It's up nearly 90% on the year and it's gone from a discount in asset value at the start of the year to a premium of over 25% at the end of the year. It's got a very concentrated portfolio with a discount retailer called Action having about a 52% share of the whole portfolio, which is quite odd for such a large private equity investment trust. And it shows what can happen if you have such a concentrated portfolio behind the investment trust where you can have very good years and make a lot of money, but then also potentially a bad year and lose it all back again with things like mean reversion. So this is an investment trust that I would say is quite idiosyncratic because its portfolio isn't that well diversified. And I'm not sure how it would actually um, sell down its stake in action without some difficulty. So it's an interesting one to look at, but not one that I would potentially have in my portfolio. But if you do have it, then it's probably worthwhile researching further and holding on to. This is Scottish Mortgage. It didn't have such a good 2023. It's price mainly bumbling along the bottom, although with a bit of a recovery in quarter four. What I don't like about Scottish Mortgage is that its portfolio isn't that well risk managed and the position sizing of some of its holdings is a bit too large for me. Although things like um, Moderna, that's come down in terms of its size in the whole portfolio because the price performance has been so poor. And I think that now the top 10 holdings look a bit better for growth orientated, high risk investment trust with around 100 investments. So it's possible that in 2024, we could see some recovery in the share price. Although unlike the NASDAQ 100, which always has the winners in its portfolio, that's not necessarily the case for Scottish Mortgage. So if you're interested in backing like technology and high growth companies, you might also want to consider the NASDAQ. This is another idiosyncratic investment trust. It's Pershing Square. It had a pretty good 2023, finishing on an all time high, but then it also had quite strong performance at the end of 2022. This is its performance over five years compared to the NASDAQ, where it's actually been the winner. But the problem with Pershing Square is, well, firstly, the fees, and then secondly, some of the trading that Bill Ackman does, and people don't really seem to always trust him, although he has done things like being short bonds and that's done really well for him but then he's had a few special purpose acquisition company proposals that people haven't really liked so it's a very strange investment trust it's on quite a steep discount in asset value and yet most hedge funds are privately held so there would be no such discount so i wonder why he doesn't just buy it all back i think bill has a personal stake in pershing square of over a billion pounds so he's got a lot of skin in the game and it's an interesting one to watch. I've got a small position in it, but it's not really worthwhile betting the whole farm on. JP Morgan Global Growth and Income had a solid year in 2023 with its price growth largely mirroring that of a developed world global tracker. It's got a pretty solid top 10 holdings. And at the moment, it seems to be making some fairly decent decisions in terms of being underweight China and overweight things like artificial intelligence. So hopefully that will continue into the future. It's got a solid fan base of people that like its dividend policy. Also, what can be important for investment trust investors is that the price closely follows an asset value. So you don't have the risk of excessive volatility in the share price when you might be wanting to sell down your investment and i think that's a really useful indicator of a sound investment trust that has a popular support base so when the price of an investment trust closely follows its net asset value 
I think it's due to a few things. Firstly, is that investors like this strategy that the investment trust is proposing. And secondly, the trust actually follows that strategy quite closely and people have confidence in what the investment trust is actually doing. And then finally, I think it's because the fees are fairly reasonable. So the cost that it's charging for implementing the strategy seem to be worthwhile and people will stick with it and they will buy into the investment trust if it goes to a discount. And then also it's likely that the investment trust will have a discount control mechanism such as it will buy back its own shares if a discount does open up. This is the performance of the AIC global sector in 2023. The leader was Manchester and London, but I kind of discount that one because it has quite a strong biased tech portfolio and quite concentrated holdings. So it's going to be quite volatile. So number two was Alliance Trust with 20% total return and 211% return over 10 years, which is a very strong and commendable record. Down the bottom, we've got things like Scottish Mortgage, uh, things like Monks, again, didn't do too well and has had quite poor recent performance. So here's the performance of Alliance Trust compared to a global tracker. And as you can see, there's an amazingly high level of correlation. But with Alliance Trust, you have higher fees and the manager risk that the manager is just going to make some poor decisions and that the past performance won't continue. And if you bought Alliance Trust when it actually was having quite a bit of a winning streak between maybe 2017 and the end of 2019, you probably would have been a bit disappointed because it would have underperformed and reverted back to the mean of the global developed world over time. So my conclusion would be that for global investment trusts, you're probably better off in a tracker, although there is one exception to that, which I'll come to. And the exception is JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, which had another great year, 20% growth, and then a 10 year record at 265% outstrips a global tracker and it outstrips the more traditional um, global investment trusts. Scottish American is an interesting investment trust and it is commendable. However, it does have a few odd holdings like a 10 pin bowling alley. I think it's got some Dominican Republic bonds or something. And then the overall performance over 10 years is slightly below that of a global tracker. So in the end, there's quite a lot of effort that you have to put in and you don't really get any reward. Here's global small cap companies. So overall, they've underperformed their large cap counterparts, had a fairly dismal 2023, especially Edinburgh Worldwide with its sort of tech and maybe healthcare focus, very strong growth focus. Smithson, again, not really able to deliver a solid performance. Herald is, it's quite interesting, but it is too idiosyncratic. It's quite a mix between UK and rest of the world and tech and general stuff. And it's difficult to see really what the overall strategy of that fund is. And then the manager has been in charge since the ARC was invented and she might retire soon. So overall, I'm a bit disappointed with some global sectors, because although they should be able to pivot around the world to capture where the best opportunities are, they tend to get a bit bogged down in their own strategy. And so they don't really deliver the returns I think they're truly capable of. US small companies might do quite well in 2024, because in America, Inflation is better under control, arguably, than in parts of Europe. So there's more scope for interest rate cuts and a better environment for smaller companies. And then also because they have a much larger market, something like a Weatherspoons in America would have six times the number of pubs of Weatherspoons in the UK. And so it can grow much more quickly, add value really quickly in quite a simple way. And so that's how smaller caps can grow and really add value to your portfolio. So we've got two here, JP Morgan, US Smaller Companies and Brown Advisory. The Brown Advisory, they haven't been running it for that long. So I'm not sure quite how relevant the longer term performance stats are for that one. 
So I think it's really a question of looking at the portfolios, looking at the sector exposure and the way they select companies, and then using that to find out which one might be the best for you to invest in. We've got some discounts to net asset value. So that's always quite a useful thing when you're starting out investing. So here's some data on a US small cap tracker and P ratio is pretty good at just 11, but the largest sector is financials and specifically regional banks. So that's not really the sort of exposure that I'd want. And that's why I possibly go for an active fund in this area rather than a tracker because it's a bit more of an area where a stock picker can add value. European small cap companies show a similar position with fairly stagnant growth in 2023 and the Montanaro one which is a bit more of a high growth focus kind of tech sort of fund being the worst performer. In terms of the small cap index we've got a P ratio of 10 We've got industrials as the largest sector, which is a better mix for me. Also got IT doing fairly strongly. So this is one where a tracker is a potential way to capture a rebound in the fortune of small cap companies. Japanese small cap is potentially interesting, but it's largely companies that just serve the Japanese domestic market. So you're quite heavily tied into what's going on in the Japanese economy. And there's quite an interesting mix between Bailey Gifford with its growth focus and its um, really awful performance, minus 19%. And then the Nippon active value, clearly having the value focus and going up by nearly 38%. So um, yeah, it's pretty amazing in terms of the difference of performance. For UK small caps, the performance of some of the funds has been negative and really quite disappointing. Uh, one of the standout performance has been Rockwood Strategic, although it's got limited assets under management. So possibly it's not very liquid. You might have quite a wide bid offer spread with that one. The five year record is pretty exceptional, but the 10 year record is really below average. So. I'm not so keen on the UK. You're kind of fishing in quite a small pond, but you might be able to find one or two investment trusts that match your style of investing and you're worth while exploring those further. For UK equity income, there's some mixed returns. A few have done fairly well, although over the longer term, they've not performed so good. So you do tend to get a bit of mean reversion where their emphasis seems to be popular one year and successful one year and then not so successful the next. So some of my favourites are things like City of London and Merchants Trust, where they're quite large funds and they tend to trade pretty close to their net asset value. And then they're also dividend heroes. So it's possible to lock in some good yields, even though the total share price return over 10 years is well below that of a global tracker. This is the Europe large cap sector of investment trusts and the top performer over 10 years and the largest investment trust is this Fidelity European Trust, which has had a growth of over 200% over 10 years. It wasn't the best performer in 2023. That went to Henderson European Focus. Um, but I do think that Fidelity is a solid trust. It's been covered by Fund Hunter and you can go to his website if you want to find out his detailed research. So here's the 10 year performance of Fidelity European Trust compared to a Europe tracker. And it's a very clear winner there. And the Fidelity portfolio is pretty solid with companies like Nestle, Novo Nordisk, ASML, LVMH in the top holdings. So I think it's definitely one worth looking at in a bit more depth, just seeing about the more recent history of the trust and whether there's been any changes in management or changes in strategy because the outperformance is mainly in uh, the period of probably about 2019 to 2021. Asia Pacific, there have been some quite mixed returns. Probably the worst performers have excessive exposure to China. Um, the 10 year record isn't too bad for some of these. Pacific Horizon is quite interesting because it's very 
index agnostic and it will invest in things like Vietnam and some quite interesting opportunities, although the growth orientation of the investment trust has meant that short term returns have been fairly poor. Asia Pacific equity income has worse returns than the standard Asia Pacific sector. The worst performer is the one with the highest yield, hence and Far East income, where it's actually taking money from its reserves and paying that out as dividends. So that's why the fund is doing so badly over time. And then it also seems to have quite a high China exposure. India's had a very strong year with trusts like Ashoka India and India Capital Growth Fund leading the way. And it's interesting to compare some of the discounts across this sector where you got the more large cap focused JP Morgan India on an 18% discount, whereas Ashoka is actually on a slight premium, reflecting the quite strong demand for this relatively small investment trust. People do keep saying that India is expensive, but possibly if you're good at stock picking, there may still be opportunities for some of these investment trusts in 2024. Biotech can be very hit or miss. So the RTW Biotech Opportunities seems to have had a good year, but something like International Biotechnology has not. And it's difficult to see how you can guarantee consistent returns in that sector so i'd more go for general healthcare opportunities such as polar capital who have quite a lot of knowledge in this area unfortunately healthcare wasn't much in vogue in 2023 after strong growth in previous years whether that will turn around or not in 2024 remains to be seen but i still think it's an interesting sector to look at because it has potential growth opportunities and robust demand underwritten by governments and insurance companies. For technology, it was pretty much neck and neck between Allianz Technology Trust and Polar Capital Technology, where Allianz has a bit more of a small and mid cap focus. They're both on a discount of around about 10%, which is pretty good considering that technology is coming a bit more back into favor and certainly the 10 year growth rate is pretty impressive. You'd be hard pressed to beat that. Although some of the technology trackers do come close or possibly even exceed it. Some of the private equity investment trusts have had a surprisingly good 2023 led by 3i also literacy capital fairly new investment trust has done well, although because it's on a very low discount in asset value, I'd be a bit wary about investing into that because it could experience a pullback. HG Capital Trust had a good year and it's got a phenomenal 10 year record. I'm also quite keen on Oakley Capital Investments because it has a fairly unique approach around the sectors that it invests in and its European focus. So it partners quite well alongside something like Harbour Vest that has more of a US focus, but unfortunately Harbour Vest didn't have such a good 2023. You just have to be a bit careful with the net asset value of these investment trusts because arguably they're a bit inflated due to interest rates rising and a higher discount rate that really should be applied to some of the investments. Then also some of the investments will probably be just a load of duds, the tail end of the portfolio that isn't really worth anything and can't be offloaded. Whereas these investment trusts love to talk about businesses they've exited on a premium to net asset value when that's simply not always the case. So it's quite difficult to really research these and understand what's going on, but you could have a small position in one or two of the better performers and hopefully they'll continue to do well for you. 2023 has been a year of quite high discounts on some investment trusts and one hedge fund Saba Capital has taken stakes in 10 equity based UK investment trusts, possibly with a aim of trying to force a continuation vote, which might cause the investment trust to be wound up or to try to shake things up a bit and narrow the discount on the investment trust, whilst hopefully the underlying 
companies grow in value and then that also generates some share price growth. So here's a list of the investment trust that Starva Capital has taken a stake in and the percentage that it owns. So things like Herald, things like Bailey Gifford US Growth, things like Keystone Positive Change, Edinburgh Worldwide. So a bit of a focus around growth capital here and trying to unlock some value. This has been attempted by some hedge funds in the past with fairly mixed results. So the fact that this is occurring is interesting, but in itself, it's not enough of a reason to buy into any of these specific investment trusts without doing a lot more detailed research. Here are the returns for the property sector, and it's amazing to see the wide variation. So at the top here, we've got Tritax Big Box, 15% positive return, and yet down the bottom, we've got things like Warehouse REIT with minus 16, Aberdeen European Logistics Income, also minus 16. So it's quite interesting within a similar space in terms of logistics, you're getting such a wide variation of returns. I think for Tritax, what I want to see is it not expand any further because it's possible that the marginal capital won't earn the returns that the historic older capital of better located warehouses has been able to achieve. It's a fairly consistent return that it's been able to develop over time and the yield is reasonable and being on a discount and assets is quite a useful thing so it's a potential buying opportunity um, there's also tr property which is good because it invests in other investment companies that then hold property so it's able to pivot around different sectors of the property market to get the better returns the five-year record is pretty terrible but i think that over time it should do quite well should be quite balanced in terms of its returns and so that's a reasonable diversifier away from equities without being too niche so infrastructure has struggled in 2023 due to rising interest rates a rising risk-free rate of return and better interest rates from bonds. So they're kind of classed as alternatives and they grew a lot post the global financial crisis because they were an alternative to government bonds where interest rates and government bonds were very low. But um, it's not really sure what's going to happen going forwards with the sort of returns on these investment trusts because we can't really predict where interest rates are going to go. They might decline. They might just go sideways in the UK for the rest of the year. It's interesting to look at the total return on something like 3i, which is pretty phenomenal, even though the dividend yield is always right at the bottom of the pack. So that shows the advantage of looking at total return and not just dividend yields when you're making an investment and their strategy of enhancing the assets that they buy seems to be working very well for them. There's a bit of a problem around the net asset value of some of these investment trusts because they're not in the habit of buying back shares. They've often got a lot of gearing. Um, and then also because the assets aren't traded that often, although some surveyors gone round and valued it, it's not bought and sold on a daily basis. So you can't trust the valuations as much as you can with equities. So although these do offer a diversification opportunity and yeah, there's still quite good value in most cases, I think I'd just be a bit wary of these and how much do you really understand the quality of the assets behind them. The favorite ones would probably be the larger investment trusts that have been able to capture a lot of funds. So things like 3i, INPP and HICL those would probably be the top picks to start your research going forwards. Renewable energy infrastructure had a bad 2023 with only Greencoat UK Wind delivering a positive return. For the ones that are on negative returns for 2023, I'm not sure when they will recover because I'm not sure when interest rates will be cut. 
and also I don't understand enough about the assets they hold and the long-term viability of those assets such as things like new technologies coming along that are more efficient and more likely to win long-term contracts into the future. So although these are a potential diversifier, I personally do a lot of extra research to really understand what's going on behind these investments before parting with any cash. This is the AIC sector flexible investment and there's quite a wide mix of investment trusts in here. I'm not really familiar with all of them. Caledonian investments also include some private equity and that's why it's got quite a good 10 year record. Personal assets um, just about managed to turn in a profit. So that's not bad. I think the problem I have with these defensive investment trusts is twofold. One is that I think the, high, the fees are pretty high relative to the sort of capital and total returns that you can expect from these investments. And then also because they're multi investments, you can't really split out bonds and equities. So if you're in a drawdown mode, you've got to sell the whole thing, which is the bonds, the commodities and the equities, rather than just picking a part that you think is currently at a good price, and you would like to sell it and then kind of slowly rebalancing your assets over time. So uh, also right down at the bottom, we got rougher on minus 11%, which is a really poor performance for them, given what a global equity tracker has done in the year capital gearing trust down at minus six. So I just wonder how long it will take for these investment trusts to regain their highs. And the point about something that is wealth preservation is that it should have a drawdown that is limited in duration and limited in the percentage of the drawdown. And with these ones, you've got the risk that that doesn't really happen and you get quite disillusioned with them. That wraps it up for my investment trust review of 2023. Let me know what you think in the comments. And up next, you can either look at my investment trust playlist or I've highlighted an investment trust video that might be useful for you.